Well, I am incredibly honored to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. You know, when I became a member of ALEC in 2003, I never thought that I would someday become national chairman. That will occur, that it will occur next year, a presidential year, in which my good friend, Scott Walker, is a candidate for President of the United States is even more astounding to me. So you'll have to pardon me for a moment. I am going to be wearing my hometown hat right now, or should I say, cheese head. I have had the privilege of watching Scott Walker grow into the great leader that he is today. It does seem like just yesterday to me that a very young Scott Walker knocked on my door in 1993 when he was a candidate for a special election seat to the State Assembly. At the time, I was a young mom with a cause, and I was dipping my toes into local politics, taking on my local school board. I was immediately energized by this election that was taking place in our hometown of Wauwatosa. There was a very crowded field in this primary. I was eager to get involved into the fray. And I found myself campaigning for one of Scott's opponents. That's when I learned my first lesson in politics. Never commit to helping a candidate until you have thoroughly vetted the entire field. So on that warm Wisconsin afternoon, when Scott knocked on my door, I invited him into my foyer. And I proceeded to grill him on a variety of topics, mostly education policy, but other issues that were facing our state at the time. I was so impressed by his grasp of the issues, but also his clear commitment to conservative principles. As he walked out my door, down the sidewalk, and over to my neighbor's house, I distinctly remember thinking to myself, I am supporting the wrong candidate. I said to myself, this kid is going to win. He's going places. And history has shown that Scott Walker has won many times. <laughs> and he is going places. I believe the next stop is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> so to all my friends here from Iowa, to New Hampshire, to South Carolina, to Nevada, and all the other states represented here today. I offer my first encounter with Scott Walker as a cautionary tale to all of you. You may think you have chosen your candidate for 2016, but you owe it to yourself. Actually, more important, you owe it to your children and your grandchildren to take a hard look at Scott Walker before you make a mistake like I did in 1993. In 2002, Scott was elected Milwaukee County Executive, where he continued to enact conservative principles and reforms. That's when I ran for his seat in the State Assembly. And it was through the eyes of his legislative colleagues that I had a very unique view into Scott Walker. I got to have a glimpse of his leadership. I was able to see his strong command of policy. And probably what I heard the most from his colleagues at the time, his unmatched work ethic. So you can imagine, as a freshman legislator, that was quite a legacy for me to live up to. In 2010, Scott decided to run for governor, and I decided to run for the state senate. We both faced uphill fights and battles, but the economic climate of our state was in such a terrible, terrible state that the people knew we needed a new, a new direction. Scott ran an incredibly organized and aggressive campaign, beating back hard-hitting attacks by special interest groups. In hindsight, the union attacks that we faced at that time were mild in comparison to what we would face a few short months later. Scott was elected, I was elected, and um, we faced a $3.6 billion budget deficit left to us by Scott's predecessor. Scott didn't waste any time. He got right to work, rolled up his sleeves. I will never forget the day that Governor Walker stepped into our Senate caucus 
to brief us on his plan for how he was going to deal with a $3.6 billion budget deficit. With a steely calm, he outlined his plan for collective bargaining reform, and he asked us to join him in the bold effort that caught the eye of the nation. While the rest is history, to my many colleagues here today who lived through it with us, alongside Governor Walker, First Lady Tonette Walker, we faced an unhinged wrath from the forces supporting the status quo. We stood with Governor Walker in the face of death threats, protests, recalls, more recalls, and unprecedented vile behavior that lasted for months on end. Through it all, Governor Walker never, never wavered in his support or in his resolve. And he set an example for all of us in the legislature. We prevailed. We set our course, our state on the right course. And we set an example for states across the nation. Wisconsin became a beacon of hope for reform. You know, looking back on Scott's time as governor, I see bold ideas, I see conviction, I see courage under fire, I see servant leadership, and I see an adherence to the principles of limited government, free markets, and federalism. That is Scott Walker's legacy in Wisconsin, and I, for one, I think it is time for Wisconsin to share Scott with all of America. Please welcome to the stage my good friend, the governor of the great state of Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker. Thank you. Thank you. First off, I want to say something about Leah, but before we do, I want to start with something very serious for just a moment. I mean, I'll be serious in a moment as well, but, but before I say anything else, I was just in uh, Tennessee yesterday. I know there's a number of lawmakers here from Tennessee, but I know uh, what's heavy on our heart, it doesn't matter whether you're from Tennessee or anywhere else across the country. Last week, on one day, on one day we lost four Marines, three others were shot, a Marine, a sailor, and an officer. Since then, we've lost one of those three. Uh, so I would just ask, before we do anything else, if you just bow with me for just a quiet moment of prayer to remember the families of those who were taken last week in sense, and, and their families and, and the other two are recovering, and all our men and women who are, who are in harm's way even as we speak. Thank you. You know, as you think about that, I, I said since last week we we're out on the trail and mentioned did that at each of our stops. And, you know, as tough as campaigns are, as tough as governing is, nothing's as tough as what those families have gone through over the last few days and, and many other families in the past like that. So just ask not just this morning here, but continue to lift up all the families of our men and women in uniform along the way. But thank you for coming out with a great crowd here this morning. And Leah, thank you. Not just for that. After that introduction, I should just sit down and say, that's it. She covered all the bases. That's pretty good. Uh, she's been an outstanding lawmaker in the Assembly and our State Senate now. She's been a great leader on the Joint Finance Committee. She's been a great leader for ALEC. Uh, you've got great leadership. Linda has been was great before. Phil, thank you now. And, and uh, you're going to take over Leah and just do remarkably well. You are blessed to have someone with this kind of passion on such a wide array of issues. Uh, when it comes to common sense conservative reforms in America, and you're the ones making it happen. Uh, and in a moment, I'm going to tell a little bit for just a moment or two about what we did in Wisconsin. I say we, not just Leah, but the great table that's here of lawmakers and others that they represent. Uh, there's no reason, no way we could have done what we did in Wisconsin without a great team. Because some of you may know, in 2010, everything flipped. In our state, it was all Democrat, Democrat governor, Democrat lieutenant governor, Democrat assembly, Democrat senate. We flipped everything. And then we did something unusual in politics. We actually did what we said we were going to do. In fact, I remember about a week after the election, uh, the Assembly and Senate Republicans got together in the Capitol for a caucus to kind of determine who the leaders were going to be for the next session. I came on over as the governor-elect, 
I remember it was an open caucus, and we talked about what we were going to do, and I said, you know, the voters made a clear choice. They went from all one party to another party, right down the ticket. I said, if we just nibble around the edges, the voters will have every reason, every reason to kick us out two years later at the next election. Remember, I said it is put up or shut up time. <clears throat> of course, it was an open caucus, so that was the headline the next day. Walker says, put up or shut up. <clears throat> but I thought it was a great reminder. And many of you who experienced the same thing in the 2010 going into the election, I should say, going into the 2011 session, and your states have led the way as well. In fact, there's great optimism, I think, for America. As messed up as things are in Washington, D.C., I just look at our states. You look at our states and you see in the last four or five years the tremendous, tremendous reform when you've got common sense, conservative, reform-minded leaders in the governor's office and in the state legislature. There's no end to the good that we can do for this country. And that's really important because I firmly believe that America is a can-do kind of country. We just got a, Washington, a government in Washington that can't quite seem to get the job done. I believe to turn that around, we need new, fresh leadership. Leadership from outside of Washington, the kind of leadership that actually gets things done. And I'm proud to say, as Leah mentioned, that's what we did in Wisconsin. And I'll just spend a minute or two telling you, rattling through a few things. First off, as Leah referenced, we took on the unions and we won. We won. We t- I understand you had a few protesters yesterday. For us, that's just getting warmed up. That's nothing compared to when, when you got 100,000 protesters. My apologies to all of you who saw the Occupy movement in the last few years because the Occupy movement didn't start in Wall Street. It started in Madison, Wisconsin, in our state capital, where they literally occupied the capital. They occupied it. You know why? Because those big government special interests, they believe that they can win by intimidating elected officials. They try it at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, and they've won far too often. They try to intimidate. That's why they brought all the people in. That's why they did the, the protests and the death threats, not just against me and my family, against our lawmakers. You could, I mean, the amazing. We had one lawmaker in La Crosse, Wisconsin, right along the Mississippi. His wife came home from being an emergency room nurse, and there were nails up on the, on the, on the driveway as she came in at night trying to pop their tires in the way. I mean, just the amazing things that they would do to try and intimidate us. The good news is we didn't back down. We remember the reason we were elected was not to serve the few in our state capital, it was to serve the masses across our state. We need leadership in Washington that understands that government is there to serve the people and not the other way around. We didn't just take on the unions and win though. I mean, think about the things we did. We were just talking about this at the breakfast table. We passed lawsuit reform and regulatory reform. We defunded Planned Parenthood and passed pro-life legislation. And long before that video, we passed Castle Doctrine and concealed carry so that law-abiding citizens can, can protect themselves and their family and their property. And I'm proud to say in our state, as blue as it is, our state now says it's easy to vote but hard to cheat. You need a photo ID to vote in the state of Wisconsin. I love to tell people across the country, if we can do all those things and more, 25th state to be right to work, if we can do all those things and more in a blue state like Wisconsin, there's no doubt we can do it in America with the right leadership. But you know, as I travel this country, and I was just in in Texas and Tennessee yesterday before coming here, I got to tell you, as I travel the country, whether it was in Nevada or South Carolina or New Hampshire or Iowa this past week, What I hear routinely, and you probably hear it from your constituents as well, is voters are sick and tired of politicians telling them what they're against and who they're against. Americans want to vote for something and for someone. So let me spend a couple minutes here today to tell you what I'm for. I'm for for reform, I'm for growth, I'm for safety. I'm for taking power out of Washington and putting it into the hands of the hardworking taxpayers in states all across America. That's real reform. I'm for building a better economy that helps everyone live their piece of the American dream. That's pro-growth. And I'm for protecting your children and your grandchildren from the threats of radical Islamic terrorism and other threats in the world. That's true safety. So let me touch for a moment just on each of those. 
You know, see, I'm, I'm for real reform in Washington because I know it can work because it worked in our state. Our big, bold reforms took the power out of the hands of the big government special interest and put it firmly in the hands of the hardworking taxpayers. I know it can work. We've seen it in our schools. In our state now, it's amazing. The people we elect at the local level actually get to run our schools now. There's no seniority or tenure. We can hire and fire based on merit. We can pay based on performance. That means we can put the best and the brightest in our classrooms. We're the ones who stand for true education reform. Four years later, graduation rates are up. Third grade reading scores are higher. ACT scores are now second best in the country. Why? Because when you send power back to the local level, the level closest to the people, it's generally the best. That's why we need to take, and you all appreciate this, we need to take power out of Washington for things like Medicaid and transportation and workforce development, environmental protection, education. Take it out of Washington and send it back to the states and back to the people where it's more effective, more efficient, and more accountable. Sadly, though, there's people in Washington who measure success in government by how many people are dependent on the government. We, we as Americans, should measure it by just the opposite, by how many people are no longer dependent on the government. We understand that true freedom and prosperity, they don't come from the mighty hand of the government. They come from empowering people to control their own lives and their own destinies through the dignity that is born of work. That's the American dream, and that is worth fighting for. Secondly, in addition to true reform, real reform, we need to be for pro-growth. So we've got a pro-growth plan to help everyone, to help individuals and families live their peace of the American dream by helping people create, not the government, but by helping people create more jobs and higher wages. Real choice out there. You know, some in Washington tend to believe in the top-down government knows best approach. We should go offer the opposite. We should, let's build the economy from the ground up in a way that's new and fresh, organic and dynamic that says, as long as you don't violate the health and safety of your neighbor, go out and live your own life, start your own career, build your own business. That's freedom out there. So we've got five simple things. First off, let's repeal Obamacare once and for all and put patients and families back in charge of health care. Second, let's, let's rein in the out-of-control regulations at the federal level. They're like a wet blanket on the nation's economy and our small businesses and our farmers and ranchers out there. You know, I'm all for enforcing common sense, but let's get rid of all the bureaucratic red tape. Third, we need to put in place an all-of-the-above energy policy that uses the abundance of what God has given us here in America and on this continent. We are now an energy-rich country. We can literally start fueling our economic recovery. And a simple thing to start off with, why not approve the Keystone Pipeline on the very first day in office? Fourth, we need to help people get the education and the skills that they need to succeed. If we do that, we can help people find careers, not jobs, but careers that pay far more than the minimum wage. Let the other side talk about how low wages are. We're going to talk about how we lift everyone up to find a career that pays two or three or four times the minimum wage, and you do that by getting good education. I'm proud of the fact that in our state, our education reforms didn't just improve our public schools. We were able to give families more quality choices, because I trust parents to make the right decision for their children. You see, I believe, and I think you do too, that every child Every child, regardless of what background they come from, regardless of where they live, what their zip code is, every child deserves access to a great education, be it at a traditional public or a charter or a choice or a private or a virtual homeschool environment. Every child deserves access to a great education. And I believe in high standards, but I believe those standards should be set at the local level. No common core, no nationwide school board. That's why we need to push so hard to take money and power out of Washington and send it back to our states and our schools. It's definitely more effective, definitely more efficient, and without a doubt, more accountable. I often tell people, if you take a dollar out of your, out of your pocket or your wallet or your purse and you look at it, you know, this is how I explain the, the third big thing up there. I don't call it federalism. 
I say it's more simple to explain this way. Take a dollar out. This is how you should explain it, whether it's for schools or anything else. Where would you rather spend this dollar? In Washington or right here in your own state or in your own kid's school when it comes to education? I think most Americans would rather keep that money back home where they can hold the people responsible accountable for making sure it works for education or anything else you spend it on. This is how you should explain federalism because it's all about the money and the power. And the fifth thing in terms of our pro-growth economic plan is about lowering the tax burden. See, I'm proud in our state, we, the lawmakers here and the others who joined with us, we have cut taxes by $2 billion since I've been governor. In fact, we've lowered taxes on individual rates. We got rid of a bracket, lowered the rates across the board. We lowered on employers, particularly our farmers and our manufacturers. And we've cut property taxes. In fact, property taxes today in our state are lower today than they were when I started four years ago. And with the budget we just signed, they're gonna be lower in December of 2016 than they were in December of 2010. Who else in America can say that? And, and so we've, we've got a powerful message going forward in that regard, but it's all about putting power back in the hands of the people. And sometimes people, the lawmakers here know I talk a lot about tax relief. And sometimes there are some in my capital who wonder, why do I focus so much time on tax relief? I tell them i got a simple story. Some of you may have heard this before, but Toinette and I like to shop at a place called Kohl's, Kohl's department stores. And I've learned over the years, if I'm going to go buy a new shirt, I go to that rack that says it was $29.99 and $19.99. In fact, if you haven't heard this, my friend Jimmy Fallon likes to have some fun with me on this one as well, because I talk about it all the time. But I go to that rack that was $29.99, and now it's $19.99. And then I go up to the cash register and we pull out the little insert, you know, with a little scratch off coupon from the Sunday newspaper. And I give that to the, to the clerk or, or maybe if we'd stopped at home, I get the, the flyer that gives us 15 or 20% off. Or if we're really lucky, 30% off. And then as the clerk is ringing it all up, Tonette scoops into her purse and she pulls out some what we call Kohl's cash, lays it on the counter. And next thing you know, they're paying me to buy that shirt. Well, it feels like it. So how does a company like Kohl's make money? They make it off of volume, right? See, the, the company could sell those shirts at the higher, the higher price and a few people would afford it, or they can lower the price, broaden the base, and make more money off of volume. That's how I think about your money, the taxpayer's money. You see, the government could charge the higher rates and a few people could afford it, or we can lower the rates, broaden the base, and increase the volume of people participating in our economy. Years ago, a plan like that worked pretty well under a guy by the name of President Ronald Reagan. We called it the Laffer Curve back then. Today, I call it the Coles Curve because I think you can spend your money far better than the federal government. And when we do, it'll make for a better economy. <laughs> but that ties into the third thing. The third thing, because to prosper, we need to live in a safe and a stable world. That's why I'm for true safety. You see, the Commander-in-Chief has a sacred duty to defend the American people. In my lifetime, in my lifetime, the best president when it came to national security and foreign policy was a governor from California. Governor from California. Under his leadership, America rebuilt its military. We stood up for our allies. We stood up against our enemies. And without apology, we stood for strong American values. And that brought about one of the most peaceful times in modern American history. There's no reason why we can't go back to that with the right leadership in Washington. But sadly, today, under the Obama-Clinton doctrine, we're leading from behind. And that has America headed towards disaster. You see, we've got a president who drew a line in the sand and allowed it to be crossed. We've got a president who, who actually called ISIS the JV squad, Yemen a success story, and Iran, Iran, a place we can do business with. I don't know if you all remember this, but I remember as a kid tying ribbons around the tree with my brother and I in front of the tree in front of our house for the 444 days 
that Iran held 52 Americans hostage. Iran has not changed much since then. Iran is not a place we should be doing business with as president. I will terminate the deal with Iran on the very first day, reinstate the sanctions, work with the Congress to put in place more crippling sanctions, and convince our allies to do the same. Iran is not a place we should be doing business with. We've got a president who earlier this year proclaimed that climate change was the greatest threat to future generations. Mr. President, I respectfully disagree. The greatest threat to future generations is radical Islamic terrorism, and we need to do something about it. We can start by lifting the, sanction, lifting the restrictions, the political restrictions that this administration has put on our military personnel already in Iraq so they can support and help our Kurd and Sunni allies reclaim the territory taken by ISIS because on behalf of your children and mine, I'd rather take the fight to them instead of wait till they bring the fight to us. We need to... We need to acknowledge that Israel is an ally and start treating Israel like an ally. We need to stop Russia from, from surging into sovereign nations. You know, Putin believes in the old Lenin adage, the Lenin principle that you probe with bayonets. If you find mush, you push. If you find steel, you stop. Under Obama and Clinton, Putin has found year after year after year of mush. It is time that the United States had a foreign policy that put steel in front of our enemies going forward. We need to stop the cyber attacks from China, slow their advances in international waters, and once and for all speak out about their abysmal human rights record. We need to secure our borders, enforce our laws, and go forward with a legal immigration system that puts a priority on American working families and their wages in a way that will improve the American economy. And being here in the shadow of the USS Ronald Reagan reminds me that we need to honor our men and women in uniform by giving them the resources they need to keep us safe and the protection they need to keep themselves safe here on American soil, and then we need to make sure they have the quality and the timely health care they deserve when they return home. <laughs> but the best way to honor them, the best way to honor them is by fighting to win. You see, this is important because our goal, as President Reagan said, our goal should be peace, peace through strength. But there will be times when America must fight. And if we must, Americans, we fight to win. The rest of the world must know that there is no greater friend and no worse enemy than the United States of America. And so there's some pretty big challenges facing the next president and the, the next Congress going forward. But I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist. I love America. I know you do too, or you wouldn't be here. And as I look around this room, it's a reflection of states from all across this country. I've seen over the last four or five years, not just in our state, but in states from one end of the country to the other, that when you put in place common sense conservative reforms, they work. And I know if we put the right leadership in our nation's capital, there's no doubt we can make our country work again. We can make our federal government start serving the people instead of the other way around. We can make our country great again. And so I appreciate the time here today. I, I thank you not just for your time listening to me. I thank you for your service. For Tanette and I, our, our boys, Matt and Alex, we know what it means to our families to put in the time and the effort and to take the abuse, sometimes more than you expect. But for me, I remember back when Tonette and I first decided to run many years ago for governor. We knew it would be tough because it was a state that hadn't gone Republican since 1984 for president. But we saw how bad things were at the time, and we knew for Matt and for Alex 
And for all the others in their generation, we had to do something. And I'm glad that's the reason we ran, because after the election, as Leah talked about, when things got tough, if it had just been about a title or position, we would have walked away. That would have been it, because it wouldn't have been worth it. But for Matt and for Alex and for all the other sons and daughters like them, it was worth it, because today, I'm proud to say in our state, it's better. It's better than we grew up. When I look at this country, I have the same concerns I did when we were first running for governor. But I'm an optimist. I believe with the right leadership and the right focus and the right support from people all across this country, we can stand up and we can tell future generations, we were there. We heeded the call. We did what was required to make our country great again. You're at the front lines of doing it. Thank you so much for what your service is to your state. Thank you for your love for your country. May God bless each and every one of you. May God bless our men and women in the military. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you all. I told you I wasn't kidding. <laughs> Thank you all for giving my governor such a great warm welcome here today. I also want to remind everybody that um, one of the amazing people behind the governor is his wife, First Lady Tanette Walker. She is here today and she will also be at a reception that I am hosting at 3 o'clock in Regatta C. So if anyone wants to stop by and meet our wonderful First Lady Tanette Walker, please do that. We have a great day ahead of us. We started on a great note, of course, and it will continue to be a great day. Um, we have a variety of education programming, setting effective state-led edu education agenda, First Amendment, political speech, non-addictive medication alternatives to incarceration, leveraging innovation for cost savings in Medicaid dental programs, other educational opportunities throughout the day here at ALEC, focusing in on innovation, efficiency, accountability, and government. We also have training sessions, a field guide to defeating digital propaganda offered by Brian Glicklick. Of how handy is that? Tonight also, very important, from 5.30 to 6.30, we will be hosting the inaugural event for the ALEC Women's Caucus, the Iron Lady Reception where we will uh, hear from First Lady Tonette Walker again. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Please have a wonderful day. Look for any of us uh, on the National Board if you have any questions or issues. And I also want to thank the ALEC staff. So when you see these young men and women that have the little brown tags at the bottom of their name tags that say ALEC staff, they really are invaluable to this organization. And I just want to thank them. They always make sure that we're getting to the right place at the right time, and they make us look great. So please uh, make sure that you say thank you to them. Have a wonderful day, and enjoy the rest of the week.